Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to all our attendees at the third event in the COOLS ESG Thought Leadership Series, sponsored by Savills. My name is Ami Kotecha and I am the ESG lead, as it were, at COOLS. By 2030, 60% of the world's population will live in cities, which equates to 1.6% of the Earth's land mass and accounts for 75% of its carbon emissions. Clearly, this is unsustainable. Whilst we build out net zero carbon neutrality and natural resource management disciplines as part of our response, response in the built environment sector, we also need to consider the broader ESG issues that really center in on what will make our cities sustainable, thriving, inclusive and resilient communities in years to come. And what, of course, that means in terms of viability for design and investment decisions in the built environment sector. In order to answer some of, uh, address some of that, those questions today, our panelists who are experts in the fields of agri-tech, agri-ecology and vertical farming have joined this panel discussion. In the chair, I'm pleased to announce we have Oscar Rodriguez, Director of Policy at UK Urban Agri-Tech. Oscar studied architecture at Cambridge and his area of interest is hydroponics and rooftop greenhouses. Jennifer Bromley is an, another one of our panelists. She is head of plant R&D at Vertical Future, a farm tech company based in London. Jen is an expert in the field of plant science and has done postdoctoral research at the University of Cambridge and con continues to lead supervisions for first year students at Churchill and St. Katz. Caroline Steele is an award-winning writer and a well-known TED speaker on food and cities. She's the author of Hungry City, How Food Shapes Our Lives, and, of her, most, and her most recent book is called Cytopia. Caroline studied architecture at Cambridge and subsequently taught at Cambridge and at LSE, where she was the inaugural director on the LSE Cities program. Her 2009 TED talk, on how food shapes our cities has, has received more than a million views. Robert Peel holds a chair in the, in the political ecology of sustainable food at UCL and works at the Bartlett Development Planning Unit. Robert is a practicing food grower, grower aiming at self-sufficiency. He experiments on a high intensity agroecology which emphasizes on self-organizing natural balances. I'm very pleased to, to have this fantastic panel speak to us about vertical farming systems, urban ag ag uh, agri-tech and agroecology. With that, I'd like to hand over to Oscar to begin, uh, be begin the panel discussion. Thank you. Hello everyone. And good afternoon. So right into it. Can our urban food systems become long-term viable contributors to a resilient built environment. Firstly, let's consider the word resilience. We accept the built environment will be hit by in the future by all manner of unimaginables. And a resilient built environment must both survive these challenges and then return to some degree of functionality. For urban food systems to viably contribute into the long term, we will need new modes of not only production, but also new channels and modes of distribution. We will definitely need new skills and capacities and I'm sure new processes and forms of consumption will emerge, but most importantly, if we are to achieve a long-term measured in millennia, we need to consider how we cycle nutrient feedback and how our actions contribute to a net gain in carbon sequestering natural capital. Without soil and green level sacrifices, full self-sufficiency is probably unattainable for now, but for urban food systems to be valuable, there are three main areas of intent we could structure an exploration around. Agroecological food systems grow the quantity, quality and diversity of living organisms, contribute positively to biospheric cycles and build natural capital, all of which have declined massively since industrial society dominated and introduced the very concept of waste to a biosphere that would have otherwise just absorbed it in a, in a circular manner. I'm sure biodiversity net gain is a familiar term to anyone planning development these days. Agroanthropological food systems serve human needs. They generate joy, they 
foster healthier lifestyles, they generate food literacy and community cohesion. Lately in practice, the, social, the, the, the term social value is increasingly evident, particularly in procurement, but moving consumers to vegetable-centric eating patterns is still proving difficult. Agro-industrial food systems grow economic wealth, generate employment, and in the search for efficiencies, new products and processes, they foster technological innovation. Since time immemorial, technological adoption has presented its challenges, which we will hopefully delve into. Between the anthropological and the ecological, the systems that foster the wisdom to live within our biospheric means or our carrying capacity. Between the industrial and the anthropological is where we create new knowledge. Between the industrial and the anthropological, uh, is where we create, sorry, is where we create new knowledge. Between the industrial and the ecological, should we ever manage to achieve this combination, we have the promise of sustainable growth of both natural and economic capital. I'd like to offer a few illustrations. So allotments, both community and subsistence oriented, saved Cuba from starvation in the 90s after they lost their Soviet oil imports. Big for Victory helped Britain survive World War II. The Swedish architect, Bengt Vaughan, devised the Naturhus concept, which proposes wrapping your home in a greenhouse, processing your own waste and growing vegetables in the enclosed volume. Lufa Farms in Montreal operates a website which aggregates their hyperlocal fresh produce from their four rooftop greenhouses with other local boutique producers of other food types and then retails to subscribers via a click and collect service, employing over 200 drop-off points around the city. Aero Farms, is an almost quarter billion dollar funded vertical farm operating in the US, employing densely stacked aeroponic trays growing leafy greens in large warehouse spaces for wholesale to retailers. Vertical Harvest, in the middle, built their first vertical greenhouse on the side of a parking garage in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, and operates a labor model employing people with developmental disabilities in their high-tech conveyor belt driven facade mounted hydroponic system and stacked hydroponic trays. Brooklyn Grange occupies two large New York rooftops and diversifies their income streams by growing and selling produce, hosting events, including weddings, and serving as a, head, as a hub for progressively minded urbanites. And former Barcelona chief architect Vicente Guayart's recent winning competition entry for a self-sufficient housing block in Xiongyang near Beijing proposes a holistic timber construction biocity model where horticultural rooftop greenhouses and rooftop gardens and PVs harvest photons composters and anaerobic digestion plants process organic waste and every resident is a 3D printing empowered entrepreneurial prosumer running small businesses ushering a new distributed industrial revolution. The richest models lie at the intersection of these intents but the real opportunity may lie in how these systems might work together. So with the future in mind I'd like to hand over to Jen Bromley head of plant R&D and development at Vertical Future. So thank you, Oscar, for the kind introduction and thank you to the organisers for inviting me to speak to you today. Uh, so as Oscar mentioned, I'm from Vertical Future and I'm head of plant research and development. Um, we have a company tagline, smarter crops, healthier people. And I hope that uh, the presentation that I give you will give you a bit of a, a look into our, our company and see where where we're sat, so where Oscar framed us within the uh, agro-industrial and agro-anthropological sectors of, of the vertical farming area. So Vertical Future, we're a technical, technology driven vertical farming and research company. And our core focus and our mission uh, that the company was founded on is based on building a healthier planet uh, future for our, our planet. And as I mentioned, we're at the, the borderline of uh, the agroanthropological in that we have a, a strong knowledge uh, based uh, research area. And we're also within the agroindustrial in that we have a core of technology development and technology uh, uh, deployment uh, throughout the, the area. And so from our experience as operators of urban farms, we know that there's a need for technological in innovation and a focus on plant research to ensure the long term viability of uh, the sector and particularly to address the shortcomings that we have found as, as operators of vertical farms. 
So some of these areas include reducing energy use. Uh, we know that vertical farming uh, has a high energy demand and we see it as a critical area of uh, development to ensure that vertical farming has a reduced uh, energy uh, consumption. Also including things like automation. We need total automation from seed treatment through to harvest. We need to limit the interaction of, of humans with the crops. Uh, and that's mainly from a crop protection standpoint because vertical farms are essentially a very hyper intensified monoculture of crops. Um, our system is an innovative uh, system for vertical farming. Uh, we have sophisticated adaptable lighting. Uh, this is inspired by the responses of plants to sunlight and our in-house lighting solution gives the ultimate flexibility during the life cycle of the crop. Uh, we have tunable nutrient delivery, so we're, allow, we're able to provide both aeroponic and hydroponic methods from the same growing bed. That ensures that the crop is grown to the needs that the crop has and not the system. As I mentioned before, we have end-to-end -end automation, and this eliminates bottlenecks uh, and reduces the need for human interaction with the crop, eliminate, uh, limiting the risk of crop contamination. Uh, by having this automation and energy efficient lighting, we're actually able to uh, effectively utilise the space uh, more readily within, the, uh, within the, the, the space envelope, the volume of the building. And this is a result, results in 172% increased output per metre cubed of building volume. And the whole system is underpinned by a full farm management system. And this includes a range of services from stock and people management through to what we call the tray universe, monitoring the state of the, each crop and its growth cycle. So whether that's uh, when it's been seeded, when it's been germinated, all the way through to harvest, uh, it enables full traceability, which is important as well in the sector. And as far as our research pipeline goes, uh, we have a very diverse uh, pipeline, uh, which I, I have the pleasure of leading. Uh, and this is just a flavour of some of the areas that we're looking at. So one of the areas is in crop diversification. So we're very aware that um, urban farming has uh, different costs and different expenses relate, uh, compared to uh, rural farming. And so in order to make this economically viable, we need to look at the possibilities of producing higher value crops. And so with a vertical farming system as well, you're able to essentially look at good manufacturing practices and good agricultural practices all the way from uh, seeding the, the crop. And that allows you to diversify and go as far as pharma phytopharmaceutical products. We're also looking at improving the production practices. So becoming more efficient, efficient with the lights, efficient with uh, the nutrients, and as a final thing that we're looking at that I wanted to just draw your attention to is we're looking at human nutrition. So uh, we have one project where we're focused on uh, vitamins and minerals, in particular the top eight that we are deficient in or have uh, sort of deficiencies in as, as human population. And we're looking at methods to be able to improve the vitamin and mineral content of crops uh, for inclusion in downstream processing or just in a varied and balanced diet. And with that, I will say uh, thank you and I look forward to the uh, discussion. Thank you, Amy. Uh, sorry, thank you, Jen, sorry. Um, right, handing over to Robert. Robert, I believe recently you, you told me you're almost self-sufficient thanks to your urban farm in, in Brixton, which um, I think should be something people should be congratulated, a bit like getting married or, you know, their birthday. Uh, I'm sure like if the biosphere had a voice, it would probably, you know, say thank you very much and probably blast the rest of us. So um, how do you see urban food systems uh, improving our built environment resilience? Um, shall I start my presentation now, or, or am I answering your question? I, either one. <laughs> um, I, I think it's, I mean, it's very interesting um, f f following on from Jen's presentation, because in, in, in some ways I'm going in the opposite direction. And, and I think that this could be a very interesting discussion in, in the debate. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I think that mainstream uh, rural farming is very highly controlled and, and aiming for predictability. And agroecology is going in the opposite way. I think um, uh, vertical farming is, is, is actually going in the direction of pushing the control and predictability, which is already already there in mainstream rural farming and taking it to a higher level. So th there is a very strong divergence there. And I think this is a, a very interesting debate. Yeah. Um, so do, do you want to start your presentation? Sure.
Is that okay? Can you see it? Yep. Okay, so um, I'm, I'm at UCL. I, I teach a, a course called Food and the City. Um, I've, I've also produced this book, which is a Creative Commons um, ebook, which you can download for free on, on that uh, address. Um, so I, I am an allotment holder in, in Spa Hill in, in South London, and, and this is a, a growing experience, which is also a social experience, and it's kind of an institutional uh, exper experiment as well, because it runs along commons uh, principles, you know, the, the commons organization, which kind of got lost with the industrial revolution, is still alive in the allotment movement. Um, I'm practicing agroecology and I see this as something which is based on uh, n nature and so I'm, I'm aiming for something which looks a little bit like it could have evolved naturally rather than this being something which is too much uh, planted. Um, so biomimicry is kind of the principle in, in which we're, we're trying to learn from uh, natural systems. I, I'm just going to mention a couple of aspects of this. So circularity is one of the most obvious ones. So in natural systems, everything is circulated around, nothing gets wasted, uh, there's no uh, throughput and there's no entropy. And uh, so in, in a, a forest, this is what happens and, and the uh, nutrients get recycled back and there are certain uh, em emission and, and ab absorption which get balanced. And so in the composting process, which is what I'm doing, I'm taking various forms of waste and composting them down and feeding into this. And um, we can also apply this to build systems and to social systems. So that this is one project I was involved in where we created a, a community-based uh, anaerobic digestion system. So we are collecting uh, food waste and putting it through this machine, which we built using uh, open source uh, technology and off-the-shelf components sort of to make it accessible and something which keep people can adapt and then we were using it as a as a way which you know was educational in relation to um, <clears throat> circular systems that also promoted conviviality. <clears throat> the city region is a wider context and we're emphasizing this quite a lot that the city um, relates to the, um, the farming system around it and again we can apply circular principles there. Um, the other uh, thing I, I wanted to look at is this thing called complexity, which you can call uh, self-organization. So um, I, this is something where we actually relinquish control. Uh, we, we try not to make it predictable, because in a way, uh, the, the less predictable we try to make it, the more resilient it is, because the system will improvise uh, responses to challenges. So uh, this is an uh, example. So I, I started off with uh, a Native American intercropping system. Uh, so you can see maize and, and squash, which is the larger leaves than the bottom. And um, so I, I went away for quite a long time, which you don't do in conventional farming, but I allowed the system to, I trusted the system to organize itself. And so the, the areas uh, you know, the intervene, there were no weeds which developed there because the, uh, the bare soil which was there when I left it was filled with uh, amaranth, which is the spiky plants. And, and this is what they call callaloo in the Caribbean. So the, the, there's a native, the, there's a Caribbean uh, uh, farmer who was there uh, close by. And, and so the seeds from his crops um, uh, colonize this, this land. And I think that this is quite an interesting example of how uh, self-organization can work. Uh, just a little bit of the theory which goes into this. So I'm, if you read these books in, in this order, then it leads you in quite an interesting direction. So, so uh, panarchy is about self-organization. Pan means all. So it means that the prin organizational principle of the system is, um, is the system itself. And so we can see this as being applicable to human systems and to nat natural ones. The starfish and the spider is talking about using a paradigm of the internet, but relating it to Native, uh, Native American traditional uh, socio-political structures, how uh, systems which are not too centralized, uh, which are able to develop their own, um, their own nodes and, and their own interactions are uh, far more resilient to shocks. 
Um, this is something which applies it to, to the uh, internet and how we can use this as part of our new uh, socio-institutional structures. So th this, this is like a kind of Uber or something like that, which becomes very democratic. It becomes self-controlled from below. Uh, it's self-organized. And so to uh, translate this to food systems, the um, open food network is kind of an example of that, where if you, this is a sort of, uh, a continuum of these kinds of principles, which leads in the direction of the open food network. Application of, plat of, of uh, platform uh, uh, technology, which is controlled from, from below in uh, uh, innovative spirit. And uh, we've seen this as being able to uh, rebuild the social fabric and integrate some of the solution of some of the outstanding physical problems which we face in relation to food with rebuilding society. Uh, Disco Soup, one uh, illustration of this, which is an event where I was there. So this again is something where we're looking at uh, somehow um, making ourselves more resilient in terms of food, but also building uh, the social networks which make that possible. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you, Robert. That's fantastic. Um, it's very rare that you get those two ends of, of the so, sort of agri-tech or uh, you know, vertical farming community speak to each other. Um, so, um, handing over to Carolyn, whose book, Hungry City, is what I'd recommend to every Martian who's interested in the human food city nexus. Um, Carolyn, I imagine you're going to throw up some challenges, which I'm quite excited about. Um, well, I, I think uh, challenges, yes, we all face the same challenge, really, which is basically... Um, in essence, how are we going to live good lives through the 21st century? Um, and for me, you know, the question of how we're going to eat is absolutely central to that. And I think, you know, the reason I invented this word, Zootopia, you can see me clutching my uh, book, which actually came out the same week as the global pandemic, um, is uh, in essence sort of saying that food, and it's delightful to be here today, and by the way, I should say thank you very much for inviting me, um, is, you know, we need to put it at the centre of our thinking. So actually I would incorporate all elements of the conversation we've been having so far very much. Um, as I say, Zootopia is a word uh, I invented about 15 years ago and it just means food place. Um, and I did it because it strikes me that we live in a world shaped by food um, in many ways that we recognise, but obviously also in many ways that we don't. So. Um, you know, I mean, this is perhaps my favourite example of, of the sort of a food shaped world, if you like, you know, uh, the wonderful Laurent Setti allegory, the effects of good government, uh, where we see the city and the countryside living in perfect harmony. Um, and of course, you know, this is a, utop a utopian vision, um, because it sort of, it, it represents the two halves of urban civilization and states that they really need to be in balance. Um, but of course, as we know through most of urban history, those two halves of the urban story have not been in balance, you know, so I call this the urban paradox, you know, the fact that we think of ourselves as urban, but actually, since a lot of our food comes from elsewhere, um, a place we can loosely describe as countryside, um, you know, the question is, do we really live in the city or do we live where our food is produced? Um, I'm obviously skating through, and, and anyway, um, lots of big ideas very, very rapidly here. Um, I think most people living in cities probably thought that the food problem had been solved, um, you know, until this happened a year ago, this is my local supermarket, and it was a major shock. Um, of course, those of us who think about the question of how you feed a city, if you like, um, uh, realised that we hadn't solved the problem. Um, and I've just put together this very, very kind of generalised uh, sort of vision or but you know way of sort of saying how our advances in the way we feed ourselves have also changed the way we live absolutely fundamentally so we've gone from the control of fire and hunter gathering to farming and living on farms and then 
the invention of industrialization basically allowed us to live in cities. And now, of course, there's all these kind of amazing technologies coming along. And the question, of course, is how are we going to live in the future? Um, and is it all necessarily good? Um, and I think, you know, another key point I want to get across is the fact that um, we've built a society, modern society, and indeed our modern idea of a good life is predicated on the existence of cheap food. Uh, and I just want to very state very strongly that cheap food doesn't exist and cannot exist. Um, and if you think about it, what food is, is it consists of living things that we kill so we can live. So, you know, if you cheapen food, you cheapen life. That's the shorthand. And this is just a sort of a, again, a very rapid visual demonstration of some of the externalities of the way we now feed ourselves. It, shorthand is it's destroying us and the planet. Um, it's going global as a model. The industrial food system, which is very exploitative, basically treats nature as though it comes for free because there's a lot of embedded profit in uh, this way of eating and of course also as our ancestors knew and we seem to have forgotten control of food is power. Um, so I think we've reached a crisis point and I love this uh, question posed by the British architect Cedric Price, some of you may know, he said technology is the answer but what is the question? And for me you know it's really interesting if we do ask you know what is the question we're trying to ask here as I say it hasn't really changed since we started living in cities and the question is basically how do we eat and how do we live and as I say they're, they're questions that are so similar you may as well do this. Um, it's very interesting and much utopian thought they've sought to balance the city and the countryside um, and I think you know that's really sort of why I ended up inventing the word Zootopia because it's like a kind of practical food-based alternative to Utopia, uh, which asks basically all the same questions, but in a way that you can actually achieve because Utopia can't exist, but Zootopia we already live in. Uh, we just live in a bad one because we don't value food. So this is the kind of thinking we need. What kind of way of feeding ourselves is actually going to result in a good life? And it's that way up. Um, I'm very interested in the concept of oikonomia, which basically means household management or if you like, you know, uh, the self-sufficiency of a city or a state as posited by Aristotle here um, is about balancing our dual needs for society and nature. Um, so it's incorporating food into our thinking. Five minutes isn't very long, is it? And it's about balancing the city and the countryside. There's many examples of how to do that. But ultimately, it's about uh, seeing all the big problems we face and indeed the world through the lens of food. And by valuing food more, we can answer all these problems. And there's much more in here. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much. OK, so in the interest of bridging schisms, if you can call them that, the first question or goes to both Robert and Jen, because I don't believe that they're necessarily, that they have to be at the opposite ends of any particular spectrum. So where might the agroecological and agroindustrial modes intersect? Are there metabolic, operational or social points of exchange for a warehouse, vertical farm and a community allotment? Or is this wishful thinking given the rigors of both? What about compost teas? So if I might begin, um, so I, 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 I think there's a very sort of close uh, sort of uh, melding of the agroecological and the agroindustrial. Um, a lot of what we do within sort of the industrial plant production uh, space is very much like as, as, as Roger was talking about, uh, sorry, Robert was talking about, it's very focused on the plant and how the plant grows and we do and we provide the inputs that the plant needs um, our whole systems um, the lighting the nutrient delivery it's all designed based on how we know plants respond to the environment so when if it comes you know down to the sort of the, the biochemistry of the plant uh, how how that particular plant is responding to the light based on its photoreceptors um, we we understand how they work so we understand how uh, the light we should what sort of light we should be giving them um, so we have that sort of the learning from the natural ecosystems is is, is being implemented um, it's very different obviously to how how Robert is implementing it but it's it's still being implemented 
Um, and we also, and in terms of sort of the, the closed loop and the zero waste side of things, that's something that's very much sort of at the heart of the vertical farming uh, industry. Um, you know, we're not looking to to cause additional burden on the environment. That's that's not why uh, we exist. We exist because we want to be able to, um, you know, improve food production. We want to be able to improve uh, where it is, the location, the proximity to, to the people who are going to consume the food. So looking at uh, what Carolyn was saying about, you know, do we live where the food's produced or or not? Well, the answer is you, you can you can live in an urban environment and near where food is produced. It's just you have to think about food production in a different way um, and we, we we sort of look at the sort of the closed loop side of things you know there's so many different ways of bringing new sort of like plants in um, and what like the material that you're producing that that isn't sort of sold as a crop so like for example the roots uh, from a from a salad crop you know they're fully compostable they can go back into the into the into the streams they can like go back into that sort of uh, nutrient management system it's not that everything's going to landfill and just dumped things can be used again you know um urban farms are being uh, cited near like uh, anaerobic digesters things like that uh, people are looking to make use of um wastes from urban farming but also using wastes from other systems so um, data centres, for example, are a prime thing uh, to site uh, uh, an urban farm next to because you've got that huge amount of heat coming from that data centre that can be used to power part of your, your, your farm. Robert, if you could uh, turn on your camera, that'd be great. Is Robert there? <laughs> Yeah, thanks very much. Um, I, 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 I do love the tech side. I, I was going to ask Oscar, uh, this, the Martian you were talking about is like Matt, Matt Damon. <laughs> yeah. um, I, 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 but but, but I, I'm, I, I'm really fascinated by technology and I'm, I'm following all of the debates about growing food in outer space and that kind of stuff. So, so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely, uh, I'm absolutely on, on, on that side. Um, I, I just thought it was very interesting, nevertheless, to, uh, I mean, I, th I think certainly, uh, I, I, and, and, and I've argued for some time, you know, there, there are many different uh, aspects of uh, the way in which farming and, and green space can be used in, in the city, and, um, I'm, uh, and, and I think they, they can all interact with one another. I think, you know, wilding parts of the city are important important uh, re uh, restoring biodiversity here and, and that kind of thing and, and I, I've always argued that um, ultra high tech uh, farming was was part of the urban uh, fabric in, 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 in terms of this sort of structure so, so I, I, I don't see the, I, I you know I quite agree with Jen there isn't necessarily a contradiction here um, I, I, I do use LED grow lights myself when, when I'm growing uh, crops which have to be sown in, in, at a time of year when it's still very cold, like chilies and that kind of stuff. So I'm going to be doing that very soon. And um, I, I, I think that it's very, very exciting to understand that, that side of it. On the other hand, um, in, in relation to resilience, I think it, I just thought it was really important to put this topic on the table because we, we, we talk a lot about smart cities. And I, in a way, the food growing thing is, is part of the smart cities discourse. Um, having said all the positive things I've said, that there, there are issues where systems which rely, um, if you look like uh, at, at Mazda, for example, uh, um, uh, as as a model, you know, it, it's it's it 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 hasn't been very it, it hasn't proved itself to be very resilient because it's dependent on on completely controlling all the parameters. And I I, I really like the idea of, of something which I mean, actually, we need the technology which we can control. In a way, this this is what we were trying to explore with with the uh, small scale digester, and it's there within the within the. Um, uh, open source uh, software movement and all of the, you know, the, the way in which te open source technology applies common principles to knowledge. Um, it, it's a question of empowering people to um, to uh, adapt the technology and, and to ha it, so th this gives you a kind of resilience, which, which in a way takes us back to Matt Damon, you know, um, <laughs> you, you, you need to be able to improvise and use the technology in, in different and unexpected kind of ways. Mm. Carolyn? 
Yeah, I mean, I think as I as I, I'm sorry, I, I I'm, I'm terrible at five minutes. I hate five minutes, um, and I flash <laughs> a load of stuff in front of people that they probably didn't have a chance to look at. But I think my basic principle is that um, we have to think really hard about our relationship with technology, and and technology is only there to serve us. And it's only there to make our lives better and happier. And in fact, I, I begin my book um, with an encounter I had with a sort of shell executive at the end of a TED conference about 15 years ago. And, you know, he kind of said, have you got any great ideas? Because, you know, I, sorry, I'm, that's a really bad Dutch accent. But, you know, he said, <laughs> have you got any good ideas? Because, you know, we are 7 billion people on the planet and we need to solve this kind of thing. And I thought about it quite hard. And I said, well, I think what we need is better philosophy. And he got really cross. You know, actually I could almost see the, you know, the kind of bolt bursting out of his neck because he wanted me to say algae, you know, or, yeah. or hydrogen or something. You know, he wanted me to give him a silver bullet that he could go away and invest in. And, and to me, I, I mean, I'm, I'm very much with Robert on this. I'm, 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 I'm pro-technology, but I'm only pro-technology if we're also asking the question of what is a good life? because it has to be that way up. It has to be in the service of a good life. And I don't think we're asking those questions at all. Um, I, I don't hear it from politicians. I don't hear it from people trying to you know, solve the problem of climate change or something to actually say, well, how could we be living in a way? And, and of course, you know, sort of that, that is more resilient and therefore actually solves half the problems because they were not demanding all these things because we're in pursuit of a, what I call a very 20th century idea of a good life, which is all about endless growth and endless consumption. So, you know, to me, food is just the most beautiful way of asking the question because we all have to eat. Food is an amazing source of pleasure, but it's also the, the most sort of, uh, shall we say, ecologically demanding um, element of our lives, you know, so it's just, it's a beautiful thing to put at the centre of the question of what is a good life and therefore how are we going to eat? And, you know, I would say vertical farms have a lot to offer because they're, they're you know, they minimise, you know, they minimise energy consumption, water consumption, they eliminate the use for pesticides and all the rest of it, they can be near or in cities, fantastic. On the downside, potentially they're owned by big corporations, you know, they, they exclude the human and we need good jobs. So, you know, they sort of they, they win on the agro industrial side, but they lose on the what you're calling the agro anthropological side, I think, um, you know, so but they're all so. So, again, to just to reinforce what Robert said, I think complexity is the answer here. We have to be masters of systems thinking. We have to sort of be as inclusive as possible in the way we ask these questions. And yet again, I say food for me is food in all its aspects is, is just the most powerful multi multi-dimensional medium for sort of bringing all of these questions together in, in one purview. So I've, I've seen in your book, you, you talk about how monopolistic the current food system is, how very few organizations control its it's, it's key channels. Um, monopolies aren't typically synonymous with, with the idea of resilience. Monocultures aren't either. I mean, so urban food systems, um, could they help release more control? Um, yeah. How do you think, what, what do, are we setting up a Thucydidean trap um, by doing that? Will, will there be a struggle? Um, and do we want again, there's a very interesting tension there. So again, I would say, I mean, I was very glad that Robert talked about complexity uh, and also about the commons, you know, I mean, I think these mm. two very, very important ideas that we need to embrace now. I mean, when I was writing my book, when I was writing my city and country chapter, I was I was um, expecting just to talk about, you know, kind of, if you like, that, that relationship as it sort of, as it has evolved and where it might go. And then I stumbled across the anarchists and they just took me down a completely different path because, you know, I think many anarchistic ideas, are, are they, their time has come. You know, it is about more localised power, more, more, I mean, exactly again, sorry, I'm just repeating everything Robert said, but, you know, more, you know, local sort of agency over decision making and over technology as well. You know, I think sort of scale appropriate technology, skill appropriate technology is really important. Um, and I think, you know, even under COVID, I didn't have time to mention COVID much, but, um, you know, I think the question of how we're going to live in the future has really been thrown interestingly up in the air now, you know, with all, you know, people wanting to live in the countryside because they discover they can. Um, but of course, you know, living in the countryside doesn't just mean still being an accountant to the city and, and having a pony park out the back of your room. It actually means a different relationship with land and with landscape. 
So what does that look like? How are we going to re-inhabit cities? You know, because clearly we're not going to have Debenhams on every high street anymore. So what's going to go on there? You know, the capacity for reimagining new networks, new connections, new systems of governance, critically new economies, and of course, new ecological cycles is all there. And I think everything both Jen and Robert talk about can very much be part of that. But we have to, we have, to have the political and philosophical uh, and economic, shall we say, vision first. You know, it's no good just kind of saying, oh, look, this technology can do this unless we address the bigger questions. Robert seems like he wants to uh, add to that. No, no, it's fine. Uh, I, I couldn't say it any better. <laughs> um, so, Jen, how, I mean, obviously the agro-industrial is, is kind of more commerce-led. Um, yeah, we, you know, we're, when we hear the term automation, it, it's, it does stir fear as much as it does hope. Um, where where does where does virtual vertical future stand on 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 kind of its its relationship to automation and technology? Um, is it is is that it's is there any way that it's it will soften on that or or, or sort of um, pivot in any way that might sort of or, or is it fundamentally a technological? Company? So I would say we use automation as a means to an end. The automation is there to eliminate bottlenecks. Um, because urban farms typically are in a very small footprint. You had, you're only working with a small area um, to grow in. Um, you're maximising that area by putting multiple levels in it. Uh, and so you're, you know, you're making the best use of the building volume. But in order to do that, you need to make sure that you haven't had to introduce lots of areas for corridors, lots of areas for scissor lifts to go up and down. What you don't want to be doing is what I'd like to think of creating a health and safety disaster zone is by essentially lifting people up and down and, and, and turning people into just like tray wranglers. You don't want people just spending their whole like working lives pushing trays in and out of shelves. That's not a route to, like as much as I like, you know, growing plants every day and working with plants. What I don't want to be doing is pushing trays in and out. There, there's so many opportunities within uh, the vertical farming sector for essentially a different type of employment. I wouldn't say that automation is going to push in, like push sort of people out of um, for food production in urban environments. What it does is it changes the roles that those people are going to be able to adopt. So you become more skilled and your skill sets sit in different areas. It becomes less manual. Uh, there's much less manual labor. There's, but there's more, you know, monitoring, evaluating, uh, you're able to integrate data from sensors and things like that and be able to sort of use knowledge uh, that's been built up to be able to integrate that and say, how is, how is this data that's coming out of the sensor telling me about the quality of that crop? And then that then, you know, links into the quality of uh, the experience that somebody will have consuming that food. Like, does it tell me that this is, you know, does this really like pack an incredible flavor? Does this have a really sort of good level of, of, of mineral nutrition inside it that's gonna make a difference to, to people's health? Um, that's the areas that we're looking at, you know, people gonna be working in, in agriculture in the future, less of the manual, more of the, more of like the focus on the product rather than just the sort of the moving, the moving sort of things around. Okay. Um, so, something that um, a lot of you know, a lot of our participants have probably heard uh, three words: biodiversity, net gain. Um, explain how um, you know vertical farms and the sort of agro-industrial end actually contribute to uh, bio, or could potentially contribute. Because at the moment, I believe it's not actually formalised. It's not something that it's not a calculation that you do during a planning process, for example. Um, as yet, it's something that should be introduced. It's actually something that UK UAT is, is kind of working on by sort of getting um, agri-tech ty like typologies introduced into planning use classes. Um, so Jen, could you quickly just explain how a biodiversity net gain can be achieved through a vertical farm? Yeah, so by essentially biodiversity net gain, what you can do is you, you by, I think I've, I've termed it hyper-intensification of agriculture. By hyper-intensifying in one location, you can de-intensify in another location. Um, and that allows you to, to sort of 
inc increase your biodiversity metrics at that location. It doesn't necessarily take it out of food production. You might de-intensify the food production at that location. Um, the other alternative, of course, is to you know completely take it out of food production and then and sort of go through the whole rewilding process. And for um, a lot of rural farmland at the moment, the biodiversity levels are actually pretty low. Um, so there's a huge opportunity in this space to be able to combine sort of urban or urban like vertical farming systems with a biodiversity net gain where you can, you know, you can still maintain your food production, uh, but you can, you know, contribute back to the rewilding and the increases by biodiversity of the environment. Great. Okay, so uh, a mid pandemic uh, webinar. Uh, uh, well, well, obviously, uh, it can't be complete without mentioning COVID. Um, so COVID has forced us to consider what a standby mode might look like for cities. This has changed consumer behaviour massively and our food system has undergone massive introspection. What have we learned about our resilience and um, how should we react? How should we rebuild? Who'd like think, to take this one? I, th I think a, a, cr a crucial thing which we haven't mentioned so far is a community supported agriculture and, and and I think this is a this is one of the key ways in which the uh, city can it, it can help to build a sustainable farming system in in, in a wider sense and in in a way we in, in, you know we, we can define this at, at several levels so at, at the most basic level um, it, yeah, you, you, you're simply acting as a consumer and, and you're forming a relationship with a, a farmer, perhaps in the city region and, and guaranteeing to take some uh, crops from them. So th this, this frees the farmer from being dependent on, on the supermarket dominated chains. And so th this would open up all sorts of possibilities for them to become more autonomous in relation to their planning their own farm and, and to develop more uh, sustainable practices. But, but but we could we could take this several steps higher. You know, you 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 the the, um, the urban citizen can visit the farm. Uh, then you can develop a form of certification, which gets around. I mean, the organic certification is very very problematical because it actually favours monocropping and this kind of stuff. It, it makes agroecology quite difficult. Now, if you if the if the um, consumer of the food visits the farm, then, then they can actually see what's being grown there and, and interact directly. Or of course, they could be carrying out a form of ecotourism and this kind of stuff. And this is all uh, something which is, all of these different forms of community supported agriculture are there in the real world, um, for example, in China. And um, uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's quite interesting. I mean, I, th I think we, we, when we start uh, studying um, the, the COVID situation, we, we'll, we'll see that there were quite a lot of new kind of um, networks which, which were formed. I, I think, the, you know, the self-organization principle is a lot to do with networks. And so uh, the, it, the, the, there were a lot of new kind of links between, direct links between farmers and consumers. Uh, which, which is really, really important. And this could, could provide this kind of um, dense and, and, and complex system, which would allow us to be more resilient. I mean, I think, um, I, again, yet again, to just reinforce what Robert's saying, um, you know, I think uh, indeed, you know, I, I call this actually disaster democracy. Um, because, you know, in a sort of answer to Naomi Klein's disaster capitalism, you know, where she talked about when there's a disaster, all the kind of, you know, the big guys move in and kind of take over the beach kind of thing. Um, we also see examples exactly as, as Robert was saying, you know, for example, in Detroit or in New Orleans, you know, after Katrina and so on, in this immediate creation of local food networks, you know, including food growing, but also food sharing and actually sort of literally sharing of knowledge of where you can get food, which still exists today. You know, they've actually become the core of what one actually might des describe as a sort of a new, a new society. Um, and I think, you know, this is something we could really be building on. So, I mean, for me, you know, I mean, it's, it's really uncanny in many ways, the extent to which lockdown has created many of the conditions that I was actually advocating in my book, but obviously for all the wrong reasons and in the wrong way, but nevertheless, you know, um, because I think, for example, 
Um, well, clearly I'm arguing to move towards a more local regional food system, whatever that means. And that can, of course, include high tech solutions as well, but simply just, you know, not, I mean, as, as Tim Lang famously puts it, the kind of leave it to Tesco model of, of feeding yourself on the one hand. But on the other hand, I mean, again, this is something I'm afraid that, you know, the anarchists kind of led me towards, but also we need incremental land reform in my view, you know, because I think in order to live in a resilient way in the future, we need to rethink our relationship with the land, literally. And it's also just about, I mean, I call it, what does a landscape for human and non-human flourishing look like is my kind of headline question, if you like, because we've, we've inherited this old model of cities being where all the money's made and where all this interesting stuff happens. And then the countryside being this kind of afterthought of a place where, you know, if you're old or you're young, you live, but otherwise you, you're not there and basically dehumanize it in every respect. But we've discovered now, and again, lockdown has taught us this, that as humans, this is why I flashed up Aristotle briefly, you know, because I love his term political animal, um, because it describes an inherent duality that we have to address as humans, which is that we need society, but we also need nature because we're animals, you know, so, so how do we design a landscape where we can have both in, eff in effect? And, you know, I've argued, I mean, I'm, I'm still very interested actually in, this, in the garden city model, uh, which is what led me to the anarchists actually, because it was an argument for incremental land reform and trying to achieve, I mean, Ebenezer Howard called it his town country magnet, because mm -hmm. he was trying to say, how can we satisfy our dual needs both for society and nature in one place? And of course, you know, the, what I call the fried egg model of urbanity, which is that you've got a blob of urbanity surrounded by countryside is only one way of doing that. But there are multiple ways of doing that. And, you know, I think that's something we really can explore very, very usefully now in the light of COVID, which is almost requiring that we do that. Just picking up from, from Carolyn's sort of mention of rethinking the, the, uh, the relationship with the land, it's something that we're seeing uh, already sort of coming through uh, technological inquiries. Um, you know, I know that this, uh, this webinar is about urban landscapes, but we're already seeing uh, people in the rural landscape looking at how they're producing food and thinking about how they can change things up, how they can uh, make our system more uh, resilient. So when we're considering things like imports as well, I mean, just to add sort of like add on from COVID, you've got sort of Brexit as well, which has you know changed our relationship with uh, with Europe and, and how our borders work to to importing food. Uh, people are starting to think about how are we going to how are we going to make ourselves re more resilient uh, to this. And how are we going to be able to manage the demand from within our own, like from like on, on our island, essentially? Um, and people are starting to think about vertical farming, not just in the urban environment, but also in the rural environment. Um, I would also add that um, I had the pleasure of, of, of talking to, to two people yesterday who have a very sort of a strong focus on um, having everybody within, I think it's two miles of the food that's being produced. Uh, and they've got a really great uh, system that they're looking to to sort of run it, roll out across cities uh, around the UK, where they're thinking about how are we going to make sure that everybody's within a really short distance of the food supply? How can we educate people? How can we use these sites as an education opportunity as well as a food production opportunity? Um, and, and how can we you know, benefit the population through agriculture and not just the rural population who see it on their doorsteps on a daily basis, but also the urban population? So, yeah, I mean, one of the things I'm working on is an actual garden city sort of uh, 1500 home master plan. Um, and we're at outline planning sort of stage. And, and yet one of the things I've always found interesting is why isn't there a, a sort of an overlay of the food system that you've got to address at planning, right? So why, why aren't we sort of asking the question, mm -hmm. have you got the written response from the national food system department <laughs> mm -hmm. and it kind of does reflect um the kind of leave it to tesco's mm -hmm. sort of hegemony at the moment um that again it doesn't speak to resilience um these are opaque sort of um sort of power centers that that, that need to be far more accountable um and hence, yeah, urban food systems, if they can play a part in, in, in releasing some of that power, will probably, you know, generate a, a bit more resilience. And now that we're out of Europe and we don't have this sort of easy meal ticket with, a, with our major sort of, um, you know, with our pantry, mm -hmm. um, 
I mean, power is a really important word in this conversation. I mean, I, I normally, if I give the one hour version of my five minute romp just now, I talk quite a lot about the history of politics and food because, you know, it's really interesting to see how difficult it has been historically for sort of urban authorities to feed the city and how they've got into trouble. I mean, I just, I briefly mentioned the French Revolution, for example, you know, um, and, or, or indeed Julius Caesar, who was halfway to building a canal up to Rome when, when he got kind of, you know, done in. But, um, you know, so, so politicians are terrified of food because they're terrified of telling people how to eat because nobody likes being told how to eat. Plus they know that the food system is again, yet again to refer to something Robert mentioned, but it's inherently self-organizing food, you know, and it's actually really difficult to do top down, take back control, control of food. It just doesn't really work like that. So um, politicians are terrified of it and they've been very happy for the last, two, you know, kind of call it hundred years, 150 years to leave it to the food industries, but that means that we're actually fed by the food industries, you know, and actually now we've got us, I mean, I argue that we need a, you know, we need a food ministry, you know, we need food literally at the heart of our thinking, as you say, Oscar, you know, how can you possibly design any human inhabitation without first asking how, where's the food coming from? I mean, mm -hmm. that seems to me to be an insanity, but again, for 150 years, we forgot to ask that question. I think it's just coming back now. And I think you know, it's really important we let our politicians know that they can't leave it to Tesco anymore. I mean, they're still leaving it to Tesco. I mean, as you know, the most recent agriculture bill is gonna be pay, paying British farmers to stop farming so we can import it cheaply from Brazil, which is again, insane. So I think it's a really important question. Who owns the food system? You know, who has the power? And actually, how do we re-embed it in all, all the big thinking we need to do, not just the stuff at the edges? I mean, just, just, to, um, just to follow on from that, I mean, there's a, a term which we haven't mentioned yet, which is food sovereignty, mm -hmm. which is a really uh, useful notion, which kind of comes out of the global south, but, but it's very, very applicable here. And, and it, it, it really centrally addresses the issues of, uh, of power and uh, and 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 how we you know uh, how we empower ourselves in in relation to our food and it, it actually is it's quite interesting because it's it's a sort of critique of the maybe the right wing discourses about uh, sovereignty in 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 a nationalistic sense and uh, we're 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 looking at sort of re uh, critically reappropriating the no notion of sovereignty in terms of something which is really valuable to us which is food. I think um, ultimately, again, it comes down to what you said before, Robert. What would Matt Damon do? I mean, <laughs> I mean he's he's in that situation. I mean, how would he organise it if he's by himself? Maybe he's got a few friends. Um, well, first they'd probably set up their uh, their food system because that's that underpins their longevity. Um, okay, so uh, um, um, the Q and A. Uh, are the inputs into these urban systems any better than those of traditional food creation? Especially is plant-based meat substitutes better than efficient chicken productions? This is where it sort of brings in the meat aspect. I think at this stage, we're probably just at the sort of horticultural level. I mean, Rotterdam does have a floating cow farm, but does anyone want to sort of pick up on, on, on where urban food systems could go in the future? I suppose I can sort of offer comment on plant-based protein as a, a, a sort of a, an alternative to meat-based protein. And yes, that can be produced through through vertical farms and urban food systems. Um, some of the, the, the sort of the core plant-based protein at the moment is coming from soy, comes from peas. Um, these leguminous plants, typically not vertical farm friendly, uh, based on just their rambling habit and the sort of the structure of the plant. Um, and the fact that you're basically, you're growing for the seed uh, and normally in a sort of a vertical farm system um, because of the, the sort of the costs of the inputs, um, you need a crop that cycles faster. Um, however, um, there are lots of people doing quite a lot of very good research all around the world on looking for crops that have a higher protein content. Um, I mean, something as simple as a sunflower shoot which grows in between eight and 10 days has 25% protein content. Um, yeah. So, you know, those, those things are there now 
and they can be grown on systems uh, within an urban environment. It's just a question of selecting the right product, uh, the right crop to, cr to create the product. Um, obviously, there's also a lot of incredible stuff going on in terms of sort of fermentation of, of cells that can produce like meat-like substitutes as well, which are incredible. Um, that's more sort of in your sort of fermentation style farming rather than your vertical farming. So there's less horticulture, more sort of like microbiological, I suppose, is sort of the, uh, the, the inspiration behind how that's produced. Okay, and uh, one more question. How can the real estate industry, developers and investors get involved and assist in the creation of a significant urban farming sector, which produces returns that warrant the financial commitment? I think there's never been a greater opportunity than there is right now because we've, as I said, we've got empty city centres and massive questions hanging over them as, as to what, what their future is going to be. And um, I mean, it's very interesting that if you look historically at the city, um, cities around the kind of at least the Western world, um, the last peak of kind of food growing in the city was in the 1970s when there was a general slump and you know when kind of market values drop suddenly people kind of say oh, we might as well have a farm because you're not going to build a tower block sort of thing so you know for me again as, as I say the question is how do we we by we not by by which I mean society in general you know how do we create an economic landscape um which is a link to a vision <laughs> of a good life that actually, I mean, I think actually all these synergies do exist. In other words, you know, if we said, okay, we're going to aim for a good life, which is that people have better space standards, you know, more space to live in, more access to nature, um, more meaningful jobs, some of which could be to do with, you know, food growing or, or other aspects of food. Um, and of course, many other things as well. But, you know, it's, we're not going to have this... I mean, the capitalist thing of driving down the ideal production cost of a thing to zero, which, of course, includes human jobs, you know, so with that kind of different vision of a good life. Um, and, and again, lockdown's shown us some of how this could work. You know, people have had more time, you know, and, and then we've had lockdown apartheid, because basically, if you have a nice big house and a garden, you quite like lockdown and you can work from home. And if you live in a tiny little shoebox and you have no outside space, you don't. So, you know, if if people are happy doing less if they've got beautiful surroundings and something meaningful to do, then that seems to me to be the German of idea of how we can go. And I'll just say one other thing. I've got this sort of thing in my head about what I call maximizing the urban rural interface. And, and this is giving the most people access to society and nature as possible. Obviously the internet allows you to do that because it gives you access, if you like, to society in ways that were never possible before. And you could be anywhere, even Matt Damon. Um, you know, you don't have to be Matt Damon, but you could be somewhere very remote. Um, but it can happen cri critically at any scale. And I think it's really important to say this. So it could be a generous balcony outside a flat, where potentially I can grow food, but actually it's just, it's, this can be nature of some kind. It can be community gardens at the scale of a block. It can be sort of suburban farms surrounding an urban area where there's good sort of infrastructure and good connectivity. And of course it can be the relationship between the city and its region. So it can happen at many levels, but I think, you know, if we argue for a vision, and you're clearly trying to do this Oscar, but you know, you argue for a vision of a good life that is about giving people what actually makes them happy, which is access to time, loving communities, and you know na nature close by as well as society. Um, then, then we can start to sort of rethink, as I say, the whole you know kind of what the city and the countryside are for, as it were, and how they how they interrelate. And to me, that that there'll never be a, a better opportunity to do that than now. Robert, last words. Um. Yeah, so so uh, to, yeah, to, to bring together food sovereignty and and uh, agroecology and common space uh, solutions. All right, Jen, last words. I mean, I guess you know we're seeing a massive change at the moment. Food production is changing. How we live is changing. Um, the high street is changing, and it's. I, I just add that it's a very exciting time to be involved in in sort of agronomy, food production. Um, there's there's a huge sort of switch uh, going to happen um, and it's great to see people engaging and uh, people wanting to be more engaged with their food because at the end of the day food is what sustains us all. My last words be more like Matt Damon and I'm going to hand over to Ian. 
Oscar, thank you very much. I mean, we really have covered the waterfront today. I've never heard so many references to, to Matt Damon in a, in a Coles lecture before, uh, my new <laughs> hero. Listen, thank you very much. As president of, of Cambridge University Land Society, can I on behalf of the more than 300 uh, participants attending today's seminar, thank you all, the speakers today, for their insightful, thought-provoking and visionary commentary. As evidenced by there are dozens and dozens of questions, we could have been online for hours and I'm hoping we'll uh, have the technology to make those questions available to our speakers so that they can uh, answer some of your uh, uh, ideas and thoughts uh, directly. Um, I worked out it's only about 10 miles from Robert's um, allotment in Norwood to Surbiton, but I think the concept of uh, food sovereignty and self-sustainability has come a long way from the 1970s uh, uh, sitcom, The Good Life. Uh, it is just astonishing. And I can't do justice to the quality of discussion and debate that we've enjoyed. But I would say that a time when we're having to reimagine and reposition our real estate uh, and better understand the concepts of mixed use, community benefit and social impact, this increasing relevance of active recreation and cultural placemaking will increasingly come to the fore. So can I once again thank Savills, particularly Elian and Roger for their continuing support and sponsorship of this ESG series of lectures. It's really appreciated. Uh, our next one in the series will focus on green financing. Uh, Culls has endeavored to remain visible and relevant during these extraordinary and challenging times. And although our recent activities have been and will remain virtual, uh, can I thank our nearly thousand members, including the student body, for their continuing support and participation? And I just want to take the opportunity quickly to reiterate our current, to our current students, the society is there to help you, both in terms of networking, career advice, but also in a modest fashion, offering financial support at these challenging times for your dissertation or other parts of your studies. So please let us know if we can help. We hope to be announcing a, a series of building tours and other education and uh, networking events when permitted to do so. And we've been uh, optimistic and hopeful uh, in, uh, in provisionally uh, arranging our annual Cambridge dinner for early July. So uh, fingers crossed everyone. So once again, a special thank you to Jen, Carolyn and Robert for today's fantastic contributions and to Oscar for facilitating the proceedings. And finally, thank you to my colleague, Amy, without whose vision and enthusiasm, this whole uh, ESG series of seminars wouldn't have got together. So thank you to all of you again. Thank you for everyone for joining us. And I wish you a very good afternoon. Thank you.